The ridiculous distinctions which tradesmen make among one another were the actual means of placing Miss F in her present situation. We may see every day a wholesale dealer look upon a retailer as infinitely below him, and even the tallow chandler treats the butcher with contempt. The butcher in his turn looks down on the poor barber, and the barber has his triumph over the blacksmith and the keeper of a chandler's shop. None put themselves on an equality with all except the attorney, who has an opportunity of profiting by other people's weakness and absurdities. Nancy is the daughter of a tradesman, and was taught by her parents not for the world to keep company with Miss Rapay, the tobacconist's daughter, who in her turn was taught to despise the cheesemonger's family, the consequence of which was that being taught to look so much above their own sphere, they became an easy prey to men of fashion and were soon abandoned. Nancy has a good deal of vivacity and a pretty face. She has a very pleasing aquiline nose, has excellent teeth and good hair, and is good-natured but rather haughty. She does not much care to give her company to anybody whose person is not in some measure pleasing to her, without they make it well worth her while. She has an open manner of discourse in company, which is highly agreeable, and though she expects a genteel present, she is by no means mercenary, but enjoys the sport with all the vigorous ardor that may be expected from a girl of one and twenty. Every woman has not the same talents to please alike, yet all have some peculiar to themselves. The one sings, another dances with a peculiar grace, one charms by her sense and sensibility, another catches the heart by mere simplicity. Miss Gould's particular advantage is a surprising fond humor, which she displays in the most agreeable manner imaginable. A mistress of such a turn must sure be very desirable, as nothing in the world can please equal to good humor, joined with beauty. This lady lives in very gay life, and receives visits only from the best, of whom she makes whatever she thinks proper by help of her agreeable talent. She is but slim made, is not above twenty years old, has fine dark brown glossy hair and eyes. The constraint put upon the inclination of most young girls proves very often an irresistible enticement for them to indulge them. Miss R is an instance of this. Her mother, by endeavoring to control her, raised the fire of desire in her breast, and she soon became a convert to love and libertinism. She is fond of the sport to excess, and by her own account has never yet been blessed with a satisfying meal of manhood. She never consults the person of a man, for she cannot like him without he has extraordinary powers, which are the only credentials by which a person can recommend themselves to her. She is about twenty-four, has a fair skin and good eyes, is very full-breasted and has an agreeable lisp in her speech. She has genteel and good clothes, but dresses in a style peculiar to herself. Miss W is about twenty-four, light hair, rather above the common size. How such a piece of goods first came to our market we are at a loss to guess. We have indeed heard that she lived for some time servant in Wapping, and as the Tars are good-natured, free-hearted fellows, and after long voyages, are not very nice in their choice, they might perhaps have done her a good-natured action. This is the only way we can account for it, every other seems absurd to us. Her hands and arms, her limbs, indeed in general, are more calculated for the milk carrier than the soft delights of love. However, if she finds herself but in a small estimation with our sex, she repays them the compliment, and frequently declares that a female bedfellow can give more real joys than ever she experienced with the male part of the sex. Perhaps her demands in that way may be so great that she never found a man able to supply her. This is but a natural conclusion when a lady is remarked for paying visits to a fellow only famous for idiotism. The proverb indeed is on her side, and perhaps she has found it true. The ingenious author of The Woman of Pleasure has given us a noble picture of it in The Foolish Nosegay Man. Many of the pranks she has played with her own sex in bed, where she is as lascivious as a goat, have come to our knowledge. But from our regard to the delicacy of the sex are suppressed, but in no sort as a favor to her. Our plan indeed is too confined to admit of it. But we can assure her, unless she gives over that scandalous itch of hers to sow dissensions where harmony and peace should ever reign, and which she envies because she cannot attain to, we shall not forget her next year, but be more explicit, and moreover acquaint her drone of a keeper. This lady whose genteel behavior, animated with no small degree of vanity, might persuade one from her first appearance that she is a modest woman, is nevertheless among the number of come addable demi reps who meet you in a tete-a-tete -tete about three-quarters of the way to prevent mistakes from external prudery. 
She is, it must be acknowledged, a pretty little woman, has good eyes and fine hair, a handsome hand and arm, and a great deal of that small talk which women of this caste are so apt to take for pleasantry and wit. Her apparent disinterestedness is very seducing, as she puts on all the airs of a woman of consequence, whose sole vice is an intrigue and pleasure, but beneath this delusion self-interest may easily be discriminated. She is, indeed, at the time of life when prudence ought to predominate over every passion, and yet women of about four and thirty lose sight of it the most, and require the greatest indulgence. Philosophers, account for it if you can. I will, in the meanwhile, hazard a conjecture from experience. When a woman perceives her charms decay, and finds every day estranges her still farther from her juvenile beauty, she regrets, if an amorous woman, the loss of every moment of her life that has not been consecrated to bliss, and risks an adventure that she would formerly have spurned, rather than lose the chance of an admirer, the perspective of a moment's enjoyment. By her late appearance, we suppose her much reduced. This lady at present occupies the first floor, but how long she will keep it we cannot answer. Her eyes inflamed and sparkling too, her cheek the rose and lily's hue, her nose was straight and just its height, her lips then coral far more bright. Her breasts two little hills of snow, in which two vivid rubies glow. Though one might span her slender waist, her thighs would scarcely be embraced. Her taper leg by far excelled all that was ever yet beheld. What our warm poet here imagined is in Miss S. realized, for her face has the health of Hebe. She seems designed as the handmaid of love and the servant of pleasure. Her eyes sparkle and emanate the flames which seem to glow in her bosom, and inspire that life, fire, and vivacity which animates her conversation. Her make is as elegant as imagination can paint. She is a very agreeable companion, and remarkable for her generosity, so that she is an object well worthy of the pursuit of a man of pleasure, yet in that pursuit, if he wishes the true pleasure resulting from the society of a desirable woman, he must prevent her drinking too much. She is about nineteen, and expects a brace of shiners. The novelty of this nymph upon town must give her high recommendation to those who lech is a new face. She has, however, other strong recommendations in the art she has adopted, for besides being a very well-made girl with a very agreeable countenance, she is perfectly mistress of attitudes and knows all the workings of human nature. Yet she is very decent and modest in company, and, though perfectly conversant in all that small talk which makes woman appear well-educated and is therefore very chatty, yet never known to swear. From being unhackneyed in her business, she is incapable of drinking, and we, for that, as well as other mysterious reasons, think her a very desirable companion of only about nineteen years of age. If you should think it necessary to inquire her perfections further apply as above, and, on a proper recommendation, marked in gold George the Third, she will herself give you a more full and better satisfaction as to her abilities in bed. The principal attractions of a female in a public line of life are not to be confined merely to person. We have had frequent occasion to observe this in our review, but happy it is for those who, wanting such attractions, can substitute others in lieu of them. This lady has had that good fortune, and her agreeableness stands in lieu of beauty, for her face is in lack of such perfection. She has, however, a very good eye, which would alone be no small recommendation. But what recommends her much more is a pleasantry which makes her courted as the laughter-loving goddess and the patroness of mirth and good humor everywhere. This, in no small degree, is assisted by a very good education and good temper, which alike prevent her from swearing and drinking, and, in the whole, render her an object of esteem and attention. She is about twenty years of age, and ever satisfied with a single guinea. This lady is said to be the natural daughter of Lord B, and is of a fair complexion. This lady was a few years since a servant in a gentleman's family near Holborn, in which capacity she used frequently to walk for the air with her little ward in Gray's Inn Gardens. A certain gentleman of the law, perceiving a very fine girl, which she was at the time, often in the walks, took the opportunity of conversing with her, and soon after persuaded her to come and make some tea for him in his chambers. The sequel, it were needless to relate, she was debauched, and soon after deserted by her betrayer. The consequence of which was, having lost her place, and being destitute of a character, she was obliged to have recourse to her beauty for a subsistence. She took lodgings near Red Lion Square and had a number of successive admirers. 
She was, at the time, not above twenty, tall and well-made, with a fine, open, expressive countenance, large, amorous eyes. Her other features induced symmetry, her mouth very agreeable, and her teeth regular. In a word, she was at that time one of the finest women upon the town, and accordingly made one of the best figures from the emoluments of her employments. She was some time after taken into keeping by a man of fortune, with whom she made a summer excursion into the country, but, upon his demise, her finances being exhausted, she was compelled to have recourse to a more general commerce, in which she has not been so successful as before, and chagrin added to the usual irregularities accidental to her profession, her diminished those charms which were before so attracting. Her face is now rather bloated, and she has grown somewhat masculine in her person. She may nevertheless still be pronounced a very good piece and a desirable woman. This lady adds to a genteel person an excellent understanding. Having had good success, she has been prudent enough to be saving, so as to enable herself to appear in an elegant manner, and to be provided in cafe of an emergency. She is visited by liberal company, for no others are welcome to her as mere visitors. She is about twenty, has a fair face, with delicate and well-formed features. Her forehead is beautifully spacious, and she has a very handsome mouth with good teeth, and is an almost constant attendant at the places of amusement, where she is well known by the men of pleasure and is held in estimation by them, being universally allowed to be a very desirable woman. This is an old observation, but certainly a true one, that some of the finest women in England are those who go under the denomination of ladies of easy virtue. Miss C is a particular instance of the assertion. She came of reputable parents, bred delicately, and her education far superior to the vulgar. Yet the address of a designing villain, too soon found, means to ruin her, Forsaken by her friends, pursued by shame and necessity, she had no other alternative than to turn, let the reader guess what. She was long a favorite among the great, but some misconduct of hers, not to be accounted for, reduced to the servile and detestable state of turning common. She is a fine figure, tall and genteel, has a fair round face, with a faint tinge of that bloom she once possessed, is rather melancholy, till inspired with a glass, and then is very entertaining company. She lodges on the first floor, however, with the assistance of the last lady, who lives in the parlor, they sport a chariot, but sometimes the wheels get off, owing, we suppose, to the cash being low. A few years ago, at the time when that celebrated fair called Bartholomew Fair was held, Miss W. went with some young women to see the diversions of that place. There were a parcel of young bucks singled her out immediately. One of them stuck close to her, took her round the fair, and bought her several trinkets, at last he prevailed on her to drop her acquaintances, as he did his, and to go in to the crown to dance. He kept her there till towards morning, and then had not much difficulty, being warm with wine and dancing, to persuade her to go to his bed. Next day, being afraid to go home again, she consented to lie with him, which she did for some time, and then parted by mutual consent. Since that time she has lived on the town and in different parts of it, dresses extremely genteel, is tall and lusty, has brown hair, black eyes, fair skin, and fresh color, is rather delicate in her choice of customers and high in her demands. A good pretty Scotch lass of about 24, strong features, dark hair, and eyes, with extraordinary good teeth. She was debauched by a Scotch gentleman in the army, but finding an opportunity to marry, he left her with a small present, promising her great things when he came into his wife's fortune, which was said to be considerable. But as this proved only a pretense to get rid of her, she was obliged to shift for herself and make the most of her person. She has some extraordinary good acquaintance, and does as well as most of her sisterhood. She is always to be seen at the parlor window. Her price is one pound one, but like many others of the fraternity, will not turn her back on a less sum. She will rather accept of half a guinea than her friend should return home with his burthen. This is a decent, well-bred young lady, about twenty-two, was brought up in France, her father being a man who had an extreme good place for life, during which period he could very well afford to bring her up in the way he did. But being too ambitious was the cause of her ruin. After his decease, she was left to the wide world to shift for herself, her mother dying when she was very young. Which way to turn herself she knew not. The whole of her father's effects went to pay some debts, so that being totally out of subsistence, she applied to one of those handy old women who obliged gentlemen with the newest wear an opportunity which seemed to her the dernier resource, consequently was resolved to embrace it. In short, after loosing her maidenhood for a trifling consideration, 
she was obliged to commence trader, and has for some time past obtained a decent livelihood. She is a very elegant, genteel, fair girl, light hair, and extremely fine skin. Her price is from two to five guineas. A pompous, heroic girl, without either wit or humor, but fancies herself clever without any person acquiescing with her whomsoever. She is of the red-haired kind and very vicious too, fond of the male kind for her business, which is the cause of her not succeeding as she should do. Her person is extremely well made, good eyes, fair skin, and incomparable fine hair. Never so happy as when in bed with a pretty fellow, although she gets nothing by him. Like the giddy girl, thinks of nothing but the present, leaving all future events to chance. She left an elderly man, who would have given her five guineas, to bed with the young fellow who had not a single sixpence, and having herself just one guinea, thought it sufficient to defray the expense of the night and the following day, leaving herself without a farthing for the sake of a few hours' indulgence with this favorite. Whatever money she receives from her indifferent customers, she holds in a kind of contempt, and longs for an opportunity to throw it away upon her favorite man, generally one who is penniless and glad of even a dinner. This lady lives in the first floor, was lately in keeping with a young banker, but is since with another gentleman. <laughs>